And we're live. With Paranormal Day Spirits, a place we come to get our booze on. We talk about the booze, the things that go bump in the night. And I get to do that with all my booze. To my left, my beautiful, talented, and lovely wife, <laughs> Alyssa. Hello. I took my blanket off. I see that. <laughs> Saying, <laughs> you look, cross her legs. You look like a grandma sitting over there all wrapped up in your shawl. I just like, okay, if it was just the podcast, that'd be one thing. But we got cameras going. I'm like... What are you it doing? wasn't crocheted or anything. It's like it was cute little porcupine with flowers. Yeah. No. Okay. No. But if it had like ghosts or skulls on it or something. Yeah. Be... It was. I'll find me one. Okay. I Boo- think it's boozy's idea. blanket. Yeah. There we, we go. We can have a boozy's, boozy's blanket. blanket. There you go. Okay, I'll start that. Okay. I'll figure that out. <laughs> Sitting across from me, the lovely and talented John Burkett. Oh, I'm not wearing a blanket. Clearly, <laughs> when have you ever <laughs> in the winter i'm not i'm not cold in the winter warm. either <laughs> oh so Alyssa, what are you drinking tonight g4 ah i went to tequila john hey quattro hey quattro hey, you're quattro. also doing g4 i am hey, quattro. and i am drinking our big 10 I like the ten. My God, you, yeah, it's sometimes I don't really want. Is, sometimes I don't want to get kicked in the teeth, you know, with the with the wee beastie, the the five. What's going to happen with that? Uh, Love that wee with beastie. that uh, Glenn Fittich. Glenn Fittich. Glenn Fittich, eighteen, eighteen year old. Oh that I've yes, got sitting up there. The, yeah, the new one. They put it like way tall, so you have to have a stool to get to it too to hide it from. I guess he's afraid somebody's gonna break into it. That was a gift. <laughs> right, I'm holding that for a. A special occasion. There's so a, did what in the hell? you can do it at the wedding? Yeah. So did you? I don't. I think I told you, but you know what? I got the the bottle of Glenn Fittich, eighteen year old Glenn Fittich for didn't, didn't you're I? gonna officiate a I'm wedding. I'm going to officiate a wedding. So you, you need one that. of these to go with your. Well, I I got mine the same place you got yours. Right, but but I have laminated. Oh, clergy. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I have you, the laminated trump- clergy ID. <laughs> you've trumped me. I don't have my laminated clergy And I have ID. been ordained since February 24th of 2002. I have 22 years experience as a member of the clergy uh, of the Universal you I'm get sorry, you one. Have, Church of Odessa. You have 22 Hill. years of membership. You don't necessarily have experience. Have you officiated anything? Have you... You performed any exorcisms or? Uh, well, look, it's also got the little three D like glow things, like a driver's <laughs> license. That's pretty awesome. Uh, no, I don't know if the if the Universal Life Church of Modesto, California, um, if I guess you could perform exorcisms. I'm sure, you can. Anybody no law against it. If no, you can do weddings, I mean, you can do weddings. So yeah, why not? In Texas, this does give you the rights to perform a wedding. She got the Glenn Fittich eighteen because the I, I, description talked about married flavors. Oh, so I've I offered to. Cool. Uh, I thought at some point I would get asked to do a same uh, like a, a the uh, like a same sex marriage, and I thought that would be a cool honor, right? Yeah, but didn't happen. No, all my friends that would do, they just went and did it. <laughs> They didn't ask. They didn't ask me. So (laughs) they went. They went. You most went to the the courthouse. Yeah, Yeah. I was going to say. So I'm bringing you guys a story tonight of a plague, and this is a plague of locusts. No death of the firstborns. (laughs) No frogs. How many guesses do you need? I don't. I can't remember how many there were in, Seven, in Exodus. There? So it's a plague of the people of the region in Serbia, and it was almost like a a supernatural battleground between God and Satan. So these Serbs, they were on the front line of this supernatural battle, this plague where the dead were rising to do harm to the living. Zombies. A plague that was so terrifying that the Austrian army called out three regiments of the military to deal with it. When was this? In the 1700s. 
And this isn't a plot for an M. Night Shyamalan movie. It's not a Stephen King novel or something like that. This is a legit, it really happened, recorded. Of the undead? Yep. Revenants? Hmm. Vampires? (laughs) So you realize in 1716, the first lighthouse in America was lit in the Boston Harbor? In 1716? In 1717... The Loves of Mars Mars and Venus becomes the first ballet performed in England. Hmm. In 1718... Sorry, I missed that one. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> in se- I mean, so we realize that we, we've got this, this cultural movement through there. We've got this scientific movement that's going on. Uh, and also the Spanish Catholic missionaries establish a mission in San Antonio... Known as San, well, it wasn't even San Antonio yet, but it was San Antonio de Valero, which later became known as the Alamo. The gas stations. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the city, <laughs> yeah, they started the first gas station in 1718 <laughs> in San Antonio. Very good, Alyssa. Uh, the city of New Orleans is founded by French explorer Jean Baptiste. Lumonier de Bonville. <laughs> yeah, and believe it or not, James Puckle of London was a lawyer who patented the world's first machine gun in 1718. Wait, what? Yeah, that's what I said, too. First machine this gun. This is Flintlock days. London lawyer patents first machine gun. I don't know how he how it worked or anything. I didn't look it up. I just thought that yeah, was pretty it, amazing. It would have to be multiple barrels, be the only way. Well, yeah, I'm sure. And a whole bunch of different hammers. I mean... but. First machine gun patented, 1718. Barely out of matchlocks at this time. Yeah. <laughs> right. But during the same period, over between Austria and Serbia, it was the Austrian Habsburg monarchy, monarchy was battling the Ottoman Empire yeah. in, what, in what is now Serbia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was known as the Austrian-Turkish War. There was a lot of those, actually. Yeah, there was all kinds of wars everywhere. The Siege of Vienna by the, the yeah, Ottomans. Was, it was, it, all kinds of stuff going yeah. on. And they were fighting over control of the Balkan states, such as Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania. Um, and this lasted for about two years. The fighting was so fierce that it resulted in approximately 80,000 deaths uh, within that two years. And if you lined up that many people, because I was wondering, man, that's a lot of people, you know. If you lined those people up shoulder to shoulder, okay, with the average of about two foot. People were tiny then. Too, yeah. So. so average of two foot. You would stretch between Los Angeles to Anaheim. To Disneyland. Or Seattle to Tacoma or Dallas to Fort Worth. Because it's only like 30 miles. But thir- you would... That's 30 miles worth of people lined up shoulder to shoulder. That's how many people died. And there was all manner of fighting going on. There was uh, guerrilla warfare. They had literally standing armies that were in place, in, or in other words, professional soldiers. Uh, guerrillas, there were bandits, there were mercenaries. And this took on the, the air of a religious war because of the different... Uh, religions the and Ottomans you had the, were Muslims you had the Muslims you have Christians the you had were Catholics Orthodox Jews and you had and in Serbia also you would have a uh, Eastern Orthodox mm-hmm. Christians you know so it ended up the Austrians eventually defeated the Ottomans and there was the Treaty of Passowitz was signed on July 21st in 1718 between the Ottoman Empire on one side and the Habsburg monarchy and the Republic of Venice on the other. The Habsburg monarchy uh, affected this by capturing the fortress there in Belgrade, which was the main fortress in 1717, and effectively subjugating um, Serbia at that time. So, And I'm giving you some of the history behind this so you've got an idea of of kind of what's going on and and because it'll become more important later on. But um, the Habsburg monarchy expanded their territory to include northern Bosnia, Banat, Alentia, and Serbia. As what they did to do this, think Lewis and Clark. You've got this new territory that you want to map out, and you want to learn about all the people living there, et cetera, et cetera. 
So what they did, they hired these adventurous men to go out there and map this land out and take down all these notes on it. And they used administrators for the government or uh, provisors is what they called them. Um, these explorers, cartographers, and these guys were all dispatched into the, the rugged mountainous uh, land there in Serbia to catalog everything from geography, wildlife, and the unique social dynamics at play because of all the different religions and, and cultures, right? So in 1725, Provisor Frombald entered the fishing village of Kisajevo along the Danube River near Belgrade. And this was one of the several villages that he was uh, tasked uh, to record uh, everything about it, population, uh, demographics, etc. So after he enters the village, Frombald noticed that there was a crowd that was gathering at the cemetery. And he thought he had may, maybe stumbled upon a funeral or something like that so that he could go in and observe their rituals and their traditions and things like this. And so he, he rides up there. He's got his, uh, his guide with him. He thought, what good fortune, you know, I, I get to see this. This is really cool. And so they get up there, and nothing could have prepared him for what he was about uh, to witness there. Uh, evidently, there was quite a commotion going on, uh, raucous, noisy. And he thought, well, that's kind of odd, you know, to have all this commotion going on for such a you know, a somber occasion, you know, they're, they're burying someone at the, the cemetery. So he dismounts off his horse. The crowd is just, is gathered around and he, it's too tight for him to get in close, gets off his horse and he starts walking in and he finally pushes and shoves his way into the crowd and works his way through up to the front. And all the villagers are sitting there watching as this grave digger, was exhuming a corpse. And the man that they were exhuming was approximately 60 years old. And he looked as if he was buried either that day or possibly, you know, maybe the day before, uh, based on his appearance. He said that uh, he had been covered. In, and I say he said because we know this because he documented all of it. Who's he? From Bald. Okay. Um. And Frombald. Frombald, Provisor Frombald. And he said he was bo either buried that day or maybe the day before based on his appearance. Uh, he was covered in a layer of dirt uh, when they dug him up, but his skin had still had the, the fresh appearance to it. So he hadn't been there long and showed no signs of decay or bloating. And so... For bloating to take place, a body can begins to bloat at about three to five days, and it'll start uh, building up gas, and usually subsides after about the second week. And the bloating is the internal decomposition of the organs and the gases that are released <clears throat> because of this. And I didn't know this, but a body can literally double in size, and it turns this greenish color i knew that yeah so I yours knew... would do it excessively quickly huh considering how much gas you produce <laughs> alive i already have gas Imagine you after I'm would gone. be so accelerated <laughs> the and... trick is you got you, you poke some holes in the abdomen before you ditch the body and that way the it doesn't bloat it as doesn't well bloat so bad. or you could wrap them in chicken Wire. Wire, wrap them in chicken wire, dump them in a river so that when the it when bloats, blow, it, it excludes the flesh through the chicken wire and the fish will take care of the rest. Absolutely. And then you just have a skeleton in chicken wire. We've watched too many mob them. movies. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's, that's a Colombian cartel the trick there. That's what the... I was uh, going to say, that's very cartelish mobbish. <laughs> yeah. I only so, know about the color because of the true crime stuff I watch. <laughs> right. After about two weeks, you know, the body will um, have a zombie fart. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, well, I mean, that's what happens. The The tissue breaks down to the point to where the gas escapes. And when it escapes, then the body will let all the gas out and it shrinks back down in size. Okay. 
the uh, after that it turns. Now this is after two weeks. It starts turning this blackish green color, and it finally moves on to a brownish black color with a leathery. Which is like the mummified. The look. mummified, yeah. The when they've been underground a long time, and right. um, so Frombal thought that this was really weird that they were uh, digging this guy up, you know, after just having buried him. And the villagers, as the guy comes out of the ground, is they become more excited and angry uh, as they're lifting him out of the ground, and they're shouting curses at him. And some even ventured close enough to spit at the corpse as they're pulling him out. Now, while all this is going on, there's a few villagers that are standing over there quietly and they're just praying. And they get their heads bowed. They're praying silently. And there's a priest that is there during all this who's reading scriptures and he's reading it out loud as they're pulling him out of the ground. So one of the men... Um, that were digging him up and pulling him out of the ground. He has a small crate over next to him. And he reaches down inside the crate and he pulls out a steak and a mallet. And from bald watched in shock and horror as a man takes the sharpened steak and... Plunges the, it into his chest. The stake is formed from a hawthorn tree, and he's got this huge, heavy wooden mallet. The guy crosses himself, places the stake on the guy's chest above the heart, pointed in down, brings this huge mallet up above his head, and in a huge arc, he comes down and he drives this stake into the guy's heart. So... When he does, the man issues a groan. Okay. He's not dead. That's a zombie fart. No. He issues a groan. And and as this wasn't horrifying enough to see all this, the man has copious amounts of blood pouring out of the chest wound. Zombie. He I has mean, mouth vampires. start that blood spews from his mouth out of his nose. Vampire. <laughs> Sounds like he's still alive. It does, doesn't it? So and Frombald said it's as it's as if the man were not dead, but were merely sleeping. After the head, so after they get him out, they end up and after they've staked him, they chop his head off. Hmm. The body and the head both are flung back into the the grave. And, I mean, just unceremoniously dropped in there. uh, And he set on fire. Now, the smell of burning flesh, Mm. if you've never smelled that, Mm. that is something god-awful. And most or some of the onlookers were like, they left. They couldn't stand the smell anymore. But most of the people stayed and observed the the burning of this guy so from bald has his guide with him there and he said to him and i quote what the fuck bruh (laughs) but actually he asked what had the man done to be so desecrated you know what what had he done in in life that was so bad and the guy the guide was uh, obviously nervous and reluctant um to tell the provisor what uh, they had witnessed. So the guide paused and then explained that what they had witnessed was the execution of a vampire. And the man spat as soon as he said the, the word out loud, vampire, you know, he spits. So Frombald, never hearing this word before, he said, what is a vampire? Or I'm sure it was vampire or something like that, but. One by one beer, one beer, but he asked him. He said, "So what's a vampire?" And the guy, the guide went on to explain the vampire was an unholy spirit uh, that preyed upon the living, specifically the blood of humans. And uh, Frombald asked how many victims had he claimed, and the guy told him that at least twelve for sure. And Frombald crossed himself and exclaimed, "My God, 
12 people in a couple of days? The guy said, oh, no, he's been dead for 10 weeks now. Oh, my gosh. 10 weeks, this guy has been in the ground. So, Frombald could not believe what he was hearing. And the man that he saw exhumed would have been at the outside, only been in the ground a day or so. Because he looked like he had been alive. alive. He still looks fresh, right? So, that very night, Frombald begins writing out his report of what he had witnessed. And that report was published in the summer of 1725. And that was the first time, uh, first documented time that vampire, the word, written word, was ever used in history. So that's where we get the word vampire. It came from that. And the report contained the witness statements of Frombald himself, along with dozens of villagers who had seen all this. Um, as an official government document, this sent waves of fear through the, the whole Austrian Empire. So the man who was exhumed and staked through the heart was a local man of 60 years old. Peter, I'm sorry, Petar Blagojevic. Petar Blagojevic. It's Peter. Yeah, I know that. But it's Petar. Petar Blagojevic. Blagojevic. Yeah. He's kin to Mila. Mila so after about uh, 10 weeks before Frombal came to Kisigevo, Blago- Blagojevic uh, became sick and passed, uh, passed away only after a couple of days of battling this sickness. And he was laid to rest in a local cemetery. And shortly after Petar's passing, uh, these terrifying events began taking place in the village of Kisigevo. And they were plagued with this string and mysterious deaths. Within one week of Petar's passing, uh, several fell ill, and within just 24 hours, they were dead. One by one, these people are just dying off. Okay, now, this is the point where you're supposed to say, well, that that could have been bad water, that could have been bad food, that could have been a bug going around, the flu, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Except that, Every one of those that fell ill said that a Petar or some perverse version of Petar, uh, Blagojevic, had come to them in the night prior to their falling ill. They would awaken in the night and Petar would be in the room with them, strangling them almost to death, and then he would disappear. So as he's strangling them and they're fighting and he's looking down at him, they said his eyes were like this glowing red. And some said that it was a nightmare. Some say that it actually happened and he was in the room with them. But by day eight, after Petar's death, eight more villagers were dead. Uh, the people of Kisayevo were terrified and they knew what Petar was and how they needed, how he needed to be dealt with old sneaky Pete (laughs) (laughs) right the and this practice seemed barbaric to the Austrians but the Slavic people were well versed in how to identify vampires and how to deal with them Um, the people of the Baltic region had been doing this for centuries and of course there were laws in place to prevent such practices as it was deemed witchcraft but as they described they being the Slavic people in this region, a man will do anything to protect his family, you know, uh, i.e. digging up a a vampire and stabbing him through the heart. Hmm. So after exhuming Petar, it was easy to see that Petar was one of the undead. His flesh still maintained its lifelike color, uh, even though he had been in the ground for 10 weeks. And the strongest evidence was the fact that he had flesh, fresh blood smeared around his mouth. This was obviously the blood that had been consumed by feeding on the citizens of Kisievo. And the ritual to dispose of the vampire had been the same for centuries. Ritual prayers uh, were recited uh, prior to driving a stake of hawthorn wood through the heart of the vampire. And the Hawthorne tree is thought to possess magical and medicinal powers. 
Didn't we talk about the Hawthorne tree? With Abertac? Yes. The Irish vampire? No, it was a yew tree. Oh, I thought. It was you. You would. Well, that was the, yeah, what the. Hawthorne was someplace, because I remember it being in the research Mm -hmm. I had. There's there's a lot. Yeah, you did when we did vampires. You were talking about. Yeah, I remember oh, the, talking about the, some sort of vampire hysteria the, after the Austrians first went into that area after mm-hmm. it was recovered from the Ottomans. Right. Or, or Austrian soldiers returning to Western Europe with stories of this stuff. Right. After so they, their campaign against the Ottomans. So the... So sometimes they would burn the body. Well, they would always burn the body. Sometimes they had to be beheaded first. And there's different variations. But when Fromball's report was turned into the Imperial Austrian Court in 1725, uh, this was the first time they'd ever heard about this nightmarish creature uh, in the Western world. And Fromball's account was published in Europe's most renowned journals, newspapers, Vampire mania swept the continent. <laughs> even although even belief of religious laws forbade the belief in such creatures, much less than the exhumation and staking of them. But even the Holy Roman Emperor Charles the Sixth got caught up in it. He was intently interested in vampires. Uh, he sent Frombald's findings to all the crowned heads of Europe and decreed to all royalty in Europe that any reports of vampirism be reported directly to the imperial court. Six years passed, uh, 1731, and it's during the winter, a new mysterious set of deaths began occurring, and the imperial administrators got wind of it. A rapid military deployment was deemed necessary. So they're going to send the army out this time. And this time, the outbreak was in the uh, Serbian village of Medvedia. That's it. Uh, Medvedia. At first, authorities thought it must be a disease outbreak that was killing off the villagers. However, it was discovered that people were dying uh, after falling ill and only being sick for a day or two with no previous signs of disease. So they send out a small group of medical officers, uh, infectious disease experts, and support groups. Support troops. God, I can't talk. Not support groups. I was going to say support groups. Have them all sit around in a circle and talk about vampires. (laughs) Let's try that again. A small group of medical officers, infectious disease experts, and support troops were sent to Medvedia after receiving orders from Lieutenant Colonel Schnetzer, who was the Austrian commander based in... uh, Jagodnia in central Serbia. The uh, orders were to research the deaths and report back. So a man by the name of Glosser was put in charge of the detail. So they set out for Medvedia. Glosser uh, was put in charge because he was a no nonsense kind of guy. He didn't buy into any of the uh, <laughs> superstitious folklore of these backwood Serbian hillbillies, you know. And he was a man of science. And when they arrived in Medvedia, the death toll had already reached into the teens. Uh, the specialists were alarmed because, according to the witness testimonies, the sick only lasted a day before they died. And Glosser then decided to exhume the recently deceased. He was shocked, even though most recently deceased had died several days Prior to his arrival, no decomposition had taken place. They looked as if like they had just died. Even the corpses that had been buried weeks before. What made it even stranger, there was no signs of disease or infection. No blisters, no boils, no rashes, no swollen glands, nothing. Nothing around the mouth to indicate it was like a respiratory infection. So Glosser went to his medical books and he poured over them. He's searching for some kind of answer to this riddle and he couldn't find anything. And the residents of Medvedia told him he was wasting his time and that the answers weren't in his books. Said this was not a disease uh, that was explained by science in his books. They said that they were dealing with at least one and maybe many vampires that needed to be dealt with in the way that they had always been dealt with. 
Glasser's report described a serious situation that had him completely and utterly stumped. He was a man of science, and science could not explain this. So he was at a loss. He sent the report back to the Austrian regional headquarters at Kalamagdan Fortress in Belgrade. Foreign words are hard. God, man, these are hard. <laughs> so they couldn't find any disease process for what was happening in Medvedja. Uh, and there was a grumbling amongst the scientists and soldiers alike that maybe the villagers were right. And maybe Medvedja was being plagued with vampires. So even the, the scientists who can't figure out, the doctors and scientists can't figure out what's wrong and why these people are dying and why they seem so fresh after they're dead for so long. And they're like, there's something up. And they're, they're starting to buy into this. And adding fuel to the fire then, the Serbians are getting pissed off and rising up against the Austrian forces who had just subjugated them not that long before. And they were now enforcing laws prohibiting the exhumation and staking and burning of suspected vampires. So they're saying, you can't do this crazy hillbilly shit anymore. You can't do that. You can't dig them up and kill them again. So the Imperial Authority decided it was necessary to dispatch a military force to uh, send into the region. So in January of 1732, three regiments were sent into the area. The Honorable Regiment of the Foot, commanded by Baron Fursterbush. Of the Foot. Fursterbush. Foster, Fosterbush. Fosterbush. <laughs> Fosterbush. Uh, actually, it's Fursterbush. Baron Fursterbush. Furry Bush. What? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I did not say Furry Bush. I said <laughs> Fursterbush. And the Maruli Regiment and the Alexandrian Regiment. And attached to the occupying regiments was a field surgeon named Johann Flukinger. <laughs> he Wait, had. Johann, what in her? Yeah, fluking, fluking her. He's been fluking her. Fluking her. He had heard about what was going on, was actually nervous because uh, of what he was about to to deal with because he knew some of the guys that had gone before him, some of these scientists, and he respected them, knew that they were, you know, these were legit guys that were smart. And if they couldn't figure out, how was he going to do it? And so Flukinger uh, was sure that the villagers' belief was just superstition held no merit in a modern scientific world. Nonetheless, he could not help the creepy feeling that it was crawling up his spine as they're, they're heading out there. Cause he said, even if, you know, he said, even if I can't figure out a reason for it, there's something highly unnatural about what's happening there. And if it's not supernatural, then it's something that's never been seized before, been seen before. So Flukinger, when he gets on site, he's trying to appease the villagers. And so he listens to all of their testimonies. And the villagers were upset because these <laughs> uppity Austrians, were, <laughs> you know, they didn't understand this was a supernatural battle and they were at the front lines of it. And it was not a scientific thing. It was not a, a disease process. These were vampires. And strange as these stories were, they were consistent in their testimonies. And they told a story that began five years prior. An Albanian man, Arnon Peo, had passed away suddenly. Uh, he fell from a wagon, broke his neck. But before his death, he had told a few people that he had been bitten by a vampire. And that to ward off the evil, he would sneak out at night into the graveyard and eat the cemetery dirt. We talked about this when we did the vampire thing. So he mm -hmm. would in October. Yeah. So he would eat this cemetery dirt, right? Mm, and sounds like pica. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. So he said that at times he even exhumed some corpses and smeared himself in people's blood to ward off the easel the evil and to also cleanse himself. I'm glad you didn't say he ate them because I thought that was going to be the next No, he thing. didn't. <laughs> so you gotta him fresh. He's trying that. to not be a vampire. That's his whole thing, you know. And, but evidently this didn't stop his desire for blood after he was dead because after about a month after he died, 
four villagers had reported that Arnon had come to them in their bedrooms and was tormenting them. They described this sinister grin, foul smell, red eyes that seemed to bore through them. Yay unto their soul. Yay? Yay. Well, I threw the yay in there because it sounded cool. Yay. No, not like that yay. Yay unto their soul. So... <laughs> So not long after these visitations, the deaths begin. Only a few days after the four that claimed they had been visited by Arnon, uh, they fell ill and died only a day or two later. The elders in the village came up with a plan. They would exhume Arnon and dispatch with him in the old ways that they knew that they had to do. And so they exhumed the body. He had been buried for 40 days they dug up Arnon to find that even though he had been in the ground for over a month, he seemed to be as fresh as the day that he had been laid to rest. No decomposition at all. Fresh blood smeared all over his body and even caked blood between his le- lips and teeth. They pulled him from the grave. Four men held him down as a fifth man placed a hawthorn stake against his chest and drove it home with a large wooden mallet. Blood spurted from his mouth, and he let loose a groan when he was staked. All there agreed this was definitely a vampire. Five years pass. They decapitate him, or they didn't say? I didn't. It didn't go that far into it, but um, five years pass. No one else has fallen prey to the vampire. It was over. Almost. So, suddenly the deaths begin again. 17 in just about the time period of a week. 17 people dead. So, it seemed like uh, that during Arnon's rampage or 40 days of terror as it was, it came to be known. 30 days of night. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought about. <laughs> 40 days of terror. Uh, not only had he fed on humans, but on livestock as well. He had fed on some calves. These calves uh, had matured and been brought to slaughter for food. So those that had eaten the calves and had become vampires as well. Mad cow. But that doesn't explain the lack of decomposition. No, I know. So the villagers believe that in order to survive, they must stake and burn all of the recent 17 dead. Now, one of the corpses had been staked and burned before the arrival of the troops, and the troops, of course, halted any more ritual vampire killing and stakings. And So, Flukinger ordered the exhumation and autopsies of all 17 corpses. One by one, they were exhumed and exam- examined for disease. Their ages ranged from 60 years to as young as an 8-year-old infant. Mm. So, 8-year-old infant? Eight-year-olds are considered infants? I'm sorry. I apologize. I misspoke. It's an eight-day-old infant. So, a week and a day. Baby died. Pretty common. Yeah, I know. I guess I was thinking about him killing it. Mm -hmm. No, but... They they just dug up everybody. There were 17 people that had died, and, and they dug every one of them up. Of the 17 corpses, only seven... Out of that 17. Look dead. Showed signs of decomposition. All the rest of them were still fresh. 10. That's 10. That's 10 out of the 17 were still fresh. Oof. So. He's creating a vampire army. Oh my God. So Flukinger, um, he had read the reports of all the other scientists that had come there before him and to the other cities. But he couldn't believe what he was seeing with his own eyes because he's he's having these people exhumed. He's looking at him. He's performing autopsies. There is absolutely not one rational scientific reason for them to not decompose. Rational scientific. Uh, but every time that Flukin would incise one of the corpses, every time he cut into it, it would bleed fresh blood. Every time. Every time he cut into one of these fresh-looking corpses, it would bleed fresh blood. 
blood would begin to flow as if the body was still alive. It was as if the bodies were in a state of suspended animation. In one case, the person's old skin had been replaced by fresh new skin. Uh, one woman who was very skinny in life, and the villager said who had lived on the brink of starvation, had inexplicably gained weight and appeared to be well fed. That could be bloating. No, if it was bloating, it wouldn't. It wouldn't change the weight. They would just look puffy. They They'd wouldn't look, look like they were well fed. Yeah, you don't look well fed. You just I mean, look bloated. I look bloated, but I weigh the same as I did this morning. I right, but I look bloated. <laughs> I mean, right, but you you probably look similar to you that you do now that you look this morning. Yeah. Yes. I mean, probably close. I mean, you know. A little less peaked now. Or, or. <laughs> but <laughs> not knowing what to do, Flukinger acquiesced to the desires of the villagers and all the bodies were ritualistically staked Baked. and burned. Mm. So the strangest part of all, of all of this, the death stopped. No more people died after that. So there are some things that can affect decomp rates, temperature, sure. the soil. If you're buried in a cat, some things can keep blowflies and worms. Out. I mean, there are, people know a lot more now than we did then. Okay, so what keeps blood from coagulating after death? Well, was it pumping or did it just? But even forty run out? days, whether it pumps or not. It's not going to be blood, fresh blood at 40 if days. If blood does not move, blood coagulates. It stops. That's why you have people with pumping hearts to get blood clots. because I had, They didn't have video cameras, so I can't attest to what this guy just said he saw. No, of course not. I know that there are a lot of factors that can affect decomp, that especially in you these... You can slow decomp down. You can put somebody these, in an aseptically sealed casket and... Slow, if it's cold and environment that's going to slow it down absolutely especially if it's winter time when you're there's no flies around or anything. okay i'm going to ask you as a nurse and bacteria if i stab somebody in the chest after they've been in the ground for 40 days nothing will happen or is blood, they're not going to bleed is blood and they're not going to shoot groan. out their mouth no and they're not going to groan mm -mm. you might get some juices coming you're out gonna but it ain't going to be blood they'll be goo yeah, they will be goo. They'll be goo, but not like this. Not like blood. Mm -mm. And they certainly won't groan unless it's a giant zombie fart that's been sitting there for... So how did the guy... So How when did they, he... How the original one? Yeah, and Arnon, you know, when they dig him up and he's covered in blood and has fresh blood in his mouth? I want to know. He said he was bit by a vampire before he died. Mm -hmm. How did he know? How'd he know what? How'd he know who's bit by a vampire? Like how, you know what I mean? Like who was the vampire that bit him? I don't know. Maybe it was Dracula. Who knows? Mm. Maybe it was that guy you talked about a couple of weeks ago. Who's that? The one that's been seen routinely throughout. Oh, maybe <laughs> Saint yeah, Germain. Saint Germain. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, who knows? I mean, <laughs> but I know. I just thought it was really interesting because this is they called three reg. I mean, they believed it was legit. Right, you know, you won't, you don't call troops against something you don't believe is legit, in some form or fashion. Yeah, I think it's pretty fascinating, and yeah, we've come a long way in medical science since then. But some things just don't change. Stagnant blood coagulates the right. end, and it just does unless you add some kind of. Um, any coagulant to it, it's going to coagulate. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, there are things that can slow down decomp, like you said. You, there's certain uh, there's certain minerals that can slow down decomp. Temperature, like he said. Temperature, temperature be, the soil, the environment, whether or not uh, animals, things like that can get to it. You can put it in a, into an aseptically sealed anaerobic Casker. container yeah but here's the problem with that you still have the normal flora on the body that's going to 
eat away eat at it. it. Mm-hmm. You know. Regardless, they're not bleeding. Uh-uh. Not this long. No. Not 10 weeks after. Like No, 40 days for this one guy. Yeah. But yeah. I wonder why there's no uh, modern reports or reports since then or, you know, things. In the, they killed them all off. Especially during the the troubles in the 90s in that region when. Yeah, I don't know. There was chaos and war throughout the region again. I know. I would hate. I mean, you would think this is like the only vampire that ever existed there if they really did exist. Like, I just think it's interesting. It's very interesting. His name was Paytar. That was the first one, right? uh, Sneaky Pete. That's right. Sneaky Pete Blagovich. (laughs) Blagovich. God, those names. I know. They spelled even worse than they pronounced. I mean, there's. Blagovich. That's it, Blagovic. Blagojavic. They got those C's Paytar. with the apostrophe after them. I think yeah. they have all Paytar kinds of stuff. Blagojavic. Consonants that don't go together, at least not in the English language. Yeah, there's a can of a vowel. Yeah. Well, I think it's like, perfect that it comes from that part of the world, too. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, that's where. You know. I mean, we talked about that at Halloween, that the whole thing comes from Slavic. at least the Western view of it, as we see the it Western in the Western view, world, yeah. all comes from the Balkans. Mm-hmm. It does. However, it's not just from there. It's all over the world. So yeah, there's different. Yeah, yeah. Which but is what we talked on, too. In the vampire the one. The Caribbean yeah. and... I mean, Asia, the, Fi- yeah. the Philippines, there's that thing. Uh, that, kind of like here, what it's called. But anyway, there's it's stuff all over. But for us, what we think of our vampires, they yeah. came out of... It's Bela Lugosi. They came well. They yes, came out of Dracula. they came out of the Balkans, and they were brought back to our to our Western European. Areas. And our kids think they after the campaigns with sunlight. the Ottomans. That's the new age. That's the Twilight version. <laughs> I'm with Blade. It's open season on all suckheads. <laughs> so, <laughs> on see, all suck my favorite heads. my favorite vampires were the ones from uh, the ones back in the eighties the the Lost Boys. That was my favorite vampires. Uh, that's all right. That's I cool. like them. I like they were cool vampires. I like Blade. I like Blade, and I like uh, uh, Kate Beckinsale. Let's say Kate, you know, I, I was going to say I know y'all like Kate Beckinsale. If not, other, she could have been not a vampire. Yeah, could have been in that cat suit she had on. Hey, I know it wasn't look, a cat. Don't but. like those stupid twins that twinkle in sunlight. Oh, that's just ridiculous. Blade needs to find them. I've seen memes where you where you seen Edward like sit there and and coming up behind him is Blade. Like, it, yeah, it's just finally, finally, yeah. <laughs> thank Open God. Season on all sparkly suckheads. Oh, some motherfuckers always trying to ice skate uphill. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, one of the best lines I've ever seen in a movie. One of yeah, the best he's... when you kill somebody lines. That's one of the coolest yeah. things to say. Yeah, he he's got the best lines for sure. But anyway, that's what I had for tonight. That's my vampire story. I had done one a long time. So. I like vampire stories. Does that make me weird? Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. No, it makes everybody you, loves vampire makes you goth. stories. Goth. <laughs> it, as you're in your yellow shirt, my yellow says, shirt and my and your my, porcupine my, blanket my, with flowers. <laughs> you're not very goth. <laughs> uh, I never really had a goth phase either. So, favorite vampire? You like Blade? You like Blade? That's your Blade. favorite vampire? Chris, is he really a vampire? He's a vampire. He's a daywalker. He's a daywalker. He's a half he's a breed. His mother yeah. was, he was, his mother was bitten right wow. before yeah. she gave birth. Yeah. And so he's a daywalker. I really like Blade. I like the ones in 30 Days of Night, too. Those were, you did? Those are pretty scary ones. I did yeah, were... like the underworld ones, too. I just like that yeah. they called the werewolves lichens. I just like lycanthropy. Mm hmm. Those were some cool werewolves in that movie. The The CGI was mm-hmm. pretty good. I just like that whole story. I don't know why. The idea of that constant vampire against the werewolf thing. Yeah, but I don't like it in the, in the silly oh, I'm not Twilight, talking about Twilight universe. I'm talking about Underworld. I like it in the Underworld, cutting heads off in the universe, that in the cool universe. Yeah. Not the high school universe. Not, not the middle school. You know, high school, mm-hmm. you're already grew out growing that. Nonsense. I never liked Twilight because the way I read the books, I really did. But. And what do you think? Did you like them? I read them so quickly. I think uh, I read every Twilight because I had it. They were all out by the time I got a hold of it. 
I was in college. I read them all in a week. Oh, really? I didn't put the books down. Oh, Loved them. You didn't study? This is a summer. Oh. <laughs> I had a job. I think that's all I did. But it was like a week or two, maybe. Maybe max two weeks. But I really did enjoy it. But the problem was I didn't like the movies because the people, the actors, didn't look like what they look like in my head. I thought they were not as that attractive. And see, I read uh, like Interview and Lestat. The, and, the, the Anne Rice stuff. Yeah. I read Interview and Lestat. Did you read it before you Queen saw the, the movies? Dan. Yeah, I did. Okay. So Did, did uh, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt look like they looked in your head? Not too far off because um, when you when you read the book, it's, it's probably not that far off. I mean, and of those books, my favorite was uh, Lestat because that was actually a uh, a prequel and a sequel to Interview. So it started before Interview because Interview is just when they're in New Orleans. Mm. Um, and, well, it ends up at the end of Interview, uh, he becomes a rock star, you know. I don't remember that in the movie. Oh, yeah. The rock star? It, okay, sure. I've seen that film one time. Uh, okay, it's not so really... Queen of the Damned, he's the rock star. Because oh. that's where in um, Lestat, it ends with him offing some vampires. I don't want to ruin it for the book for everybody. but And then she she gets in the coffin with him. John Carpenter's Vampires was pretty good movie that's too. pretty good i, I yeah. like that with james uh james woods such james an woods amazing actor though uh, going around killing vampires for the vatican that was that wasn't his best job and of bobby acting. elvis gets split in half <laughs> yeah it's it wasn't his best job in acting but and it had like the other bald one like the bald one Ste- brother steven i think it's steven yeah the the one yeah, that steven no bald. one talks about the but one that the, never shot anyone in the face <laughs> but he um but John, his he or James Woods is such an amazing actor. I've seen him in. Uh, you should see Bestseller. It's a really older. He was good movie. as as the pimp and golf hustler Lester Diamond in Casino. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what was the one the the sci fi movie uh, that he was? In? Yeah, was that's it? the one. I don't know. Who'd you say your favorite vampire was? was it? Sodenberg body horror film. Honestly, I, I'm going to get a lot of hate for this, but prom- Edward <laughs> Cullen from to Twilight. That's what you're going to say. You were absolutely. You've been in my gummies again, haven't you? Because <laughs> you're high as hell. If you think that I well, you just I'm like, and I'm like, you're going to say Edward. No, I'm going to get hate from John because I'm going to say one of my favorite vampires. It's Gary Oldman in uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, the film with Gary Oldman. No, no. Tom Cruise. In really, interview, interview with a vampire. vampire. Mm-hmm. I thought you were going to say Nosferatu from the Silent. I like him better as Maverick. Who? Tom Cruise. Oh, from Top oh. Gun. It the, but he he gets the the character Lestat, and you can tell that he really gets him because if you if you read the books, Lestat, it wasn't a bad guy. He really wasn't. But I forget the was it Nicholas or I don't I didn't I forget read it. the the name of Brad Pitt in there, but he. In the book Interview with a Vampire, Tom Cruise or Lestat is portrayed as this evil, horrible, nasty, bad vampire, and he's really not. And in Lestat's version of himself is not <laughs> not anything that like what was his name? Luis de yeah. Pontu Pointe du Lac. Yeah. Okay. Pont de Lac. Point de Luc. Point de Luc. Louis. 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 Yeah. He um he paints Lestat because it's autobiographical and and both of them are and he paints Lestat as this horrible guy and he's really not. So. You know, I also am a big fan of Nandor the Relentless. What we do mm-hmm. in the shadows and uh, 
Oh, also, the comedy. yeah, or oh, the mm-hmm. series, and also Laszlo, you know, from that series. Mm-hmm. At Matter of Nadia too. Uh, like, all the vampires, including uh, the energy vampire. Now, if we go back right, to the series, if we go back to the old vampires, like the seventies, like the Hammer film stuff, to Christopher Lee. Yes, right? Christopher Lee. Lee is man. He was just such an awesome vampire. He really was. I don't. Bella Lugosi. I never. It never did it for me, but Christopher Lee, oh, my hammer horror stuff. They were all pretty good. Though. Yeah, I thought so. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's our little story about. I like Serbian that story. Vampires. I've never heard that. That's very interesting. I thought it was cool that the military was called out. Makes it. That's seem what I was like. Legit. Mm-hmm. It does, doesn't they it? They really did exist at least at one time. Okay, and what'd you drink tonight? Hey, cuatro. And you drank Hey Quattro? Yep. And I drank our bag 10. We beastie. Oh, our bag. No, not we beastie. Our bag 10. You say our bag, I immediately think we beastie. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I thought we were free associating. I know. No. It's 10. Our <laughs> bag 10. So, uh, let's yeah. take care of business. So, you need to go. <laughs> if you haven't seen the Lizzie Borden episode, Go to the first Lizzie Borden episode on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, and down in the comments, make sure that you write Blanton's. If we select you from everybody that puts their name in and puts Blanton's in there, then we you will get a bottle of Blanton's for the our Blanton's giveaway. Uh, must be 21 or older. Must be 21 or older. No purchase necessary. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Subscription is required. <laughs> yeah, subscription and comment Blanton's on the first episode of Lizzie Borden. The if you are listening on a podcast right now, go down there to where you review, click that star that's all the way to the right, that fifth star. Click that one for us. Give us a rating. Tell us what you think about us. If you're listening on a podcast and you want to see YouTube, we can find us. You can find us at Three B Paranormal Spirits on YouTube. If you want to see our website, it's paranormal spiritscom If you want to see us on X or Twitter or Instagram or did I miss one? TikTok. The Chinese Spy app. TikTok. It's paranormal <laughs> underscore dash spirits, and I'm gonna. Put a copy of it right there. The dash is spelled out in that version. If you go to our website, you can find all of our cool swag, like our cups and our dad caps and boozies koozies. And we need to make a boozy blanket now. Yeah, a boozy blanket. Just in time we'll for make summer. A, yeah, we'll make a boozy blanket Perfect just for, for you. hiding under when the monsters under Truth. your bed. <laughs> That's on our website, and it's uh, you can find it in its boozies boutique. And check out our Facebook. We have a booze, B-O-O-S, booze with benefits on Facebook. Join our group. Come find out what we're doing. Check out our videos. Anything else? Nope. Any other business we need to take care of? Don't think so. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Like and subscribe. Push that subscribe button. It's right there. If you look over right about in the middle of John's arm, there's a there's a logo. It looks kind of like that one. Just hover over it. No, it's on your arm, like right here. Right there. There you go. And just hover over that and it'll be a little subscribe button. You can click that and subscribe. You don't even have to leave the video to do it. And I think that's it. All yep. right. Y'all yep. have a good night. Good night. Buenas noches. Night. I don't know how to say goodbye in search. It's a